Hello, this is Matt Thomas, aka King Unique, and I'm going to be looking at the Arturia CS ATV with you for Sonic Academy. Before we get into the plugin, I'm going to talk you through a little bit of the history of the instrument. Uh, the CS80 was uh, a big, monstrous analog polysynth made by Yamaha back in the uh, sort of mid to late 70s. It was the first affordable, and when I say affordable, I mean very, very, very expensive, but just about affordable polysynth to hit the market. There'd been sort of poly keyboards before that let you play more than one note, but they didn't really, um, they'd, they'd do things like share a filter or they'd share the volume envelope. So you couldn't really play them as individual sounds. This was the first time where every single note you played had its own filter, its own envelope, its own oscillators, and each sound was controlled individually. It's also to this day one of the most playable synths ever made. It's got a beautiful amount of touch control and a really lovely keyboard. So that's kind of what cemented its place in history. It wasn't actually the first full analog polysynth. Um, Honours for that would go to the GX1, which was the prototype, uh, a stunning monstrous machine that nobody could afford unless you were ABBA or um, Stevie Wonder or Led Zeppelin who all had one of these things. There was only a handful made and they were sold under Yamaha's Electone Organ Range brand, so uh, strange way to debut what would be one of kind of still to this day considered one of the most amazing synths but really none of us are going to get our hands on one of these short of a miracle apparently a wonderful machine all kinds of touch responsivity um, and the, lots of the ideas in here lots of the circuitry found their way into the cs80 so the 80 pretty much kind of turned the, um, the synthesizer world on its head and kind of ushered us out of the, um, the monophonic era into the polyphonics its price tag and its size meant that it wasn't going to be something that everybody could get their hands on. It, it's a huge, heavy keyboard. You need two people to move this thing, and I mean two big people. I've, I've moved on a few times, and it's, it's, it's like taking one of these things up and down stairs. It's, it's a proper life and death moment. So um, it wasn't something you could just chuck into a little, uh, little studio and squeeze in the corner. It was a monstrous thing. It cost a lot of money at the time. In return, you got one of the few synths with memories. Um, there was a kind of a hatch up the top left, you can see there, covered in a schematic. When you opened that, inside there were tiny microscopic copies of the whole front panel four times, which meant you could actually literally, you know, just by hand kind of copy across what you'd done on the front panel. And then you could access those saved versions with the, uh, the preset buttons, that kind of gaudy bunch of yellow, red, and green on the front as well as having some presets, you could access your own sort of presets under the hatch. So you had access to presets, you had polyphony, you had touch seven sensitivity that's barely been sort of uh, equal since, a ribbon controller on the front for sort of kind of bowing and sliding effects with the notes. It's really all round at the time, quite a staggering thing. And of course, it, as a consequence, attracted some, uh, some very devoted followers and none more so than Vangelis. Pretty much his signature instrument, this, um, if you listen to things like Chariots of Fire or Blade Runner or really any of his work from the sort of mid to late 70s until, I mean, you still hear the odd bit of CS80 creeping in now and then, even his modern work, but certainly through the late 70s and the 80s, the CS80 was his go-to instrument and, and the guy played it fantastically. Um, there's lots of kind of people talk about, you know, somebody having a signature keyboard, but really it's very hard to get away from Vangelis and the CS80. It's pretty, if you've encountered the sound of him playing it, it will be in Blade Runner, where it, it sort of provides a vast amount of all the kind of gorgeous atmospheric sound that's going on in that film. If you've not seen Blade Runner, you do yourself a favour anyway, it's a great film. Uh, if not, if you've never actually listened to the soundtrack, that's also really worth doing. As well as Vangelis, there's Brian Eno, uh, here pictured with a cat, not a CS80. Um, his kind of two most famous instruments are the, uh, the Synthia AKS and uh, then later the Yamaha DX7. The CS80 seemed to kind of be his go-to synth in the, the gap between those two again, late 70s, early 80s. Um, and if you heard any of his kind of early ambient work, uh, his, his kind of work with crap rock pioneers like Cluster, you're probably hearing bits of CS80 sort of slipped in there. So, if it's so wonderful, why doesn't everybody have one and why aren't they still making them? Well, as I said before, it's big, it's expensive and also unreliable. Inside is an absolute minefield of uh, wiring. It's one of the densest and kind of most demanding synths to service out there. Um, there's a guy in London called Kent Spong, a fantastic name, who uh, services these things to an incredible degree um, and it takes him you know, days to get through one of these machines. Um, and this guy's been doing it his whole life. So owning a CS80 is a kind of a, a lovely dream most of us have and a wonderful thing if you get the chance. 
but in reality it's expensive um, and you know if you look at it funny it can go out of tune so there was a gap there after the uh, the 80 kind of became the stuff of legends and the price began to climb out of everybody's reach and that was filled by Arturia and initially they brought out the CSA TV some years ago now and it's been kind of refined and improved over the years to the 82 uh, and just this year, in fact, while I've been recording this uh, this tutorial, the uh, the version three has appeared with a complete revamp. The, uh, the front panel now resembles the real machine fog more. Uh, the the engine under the hood's been tweaked a bit. So that's a quick history of how we ended up looking at this synth. It's not just a uh, a random plug-in that somebody's coded together. It's a recreation of one of the all-time absolute genuine classics. Probably the most expensive analog uh, second-hand keyboard on the market. So let's see what it can do. Thank you. 